Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. This is lecture 8 where I'll ask the question and try to answer it, how do you use fossils to tell time? Using fossils to tell time is referred to as biostratigraphy. And biostratigraphy is one of the fundamental sort of techniques that geologists have used since the foundation of the discipline of geology. This is the first geological map that was produced by William Smith in the 1820s and early 1800s. It is the first map that divides up the rocks into different lithologies and different characteristics as well as the differences in the fossils that are discovered within the rocks. And this was a key discovery in geology and has been the key to understanding the history of the planet that we live on. So biostratigraphy was fundamental in the early study of rocks. In fact, this is the key to use for the color codes that you see on the map of England over there. And if you zoom in, you can see that William Smith back in the 1820s you know, 39 years before Darwin published The Origin of Species, divided up the rocks based on fossils. Because geologists realized that as you move from one rock to another rock, the characteristics of the rocks and the fossils that you find in those rocks changes fundamentally. Now, geologists often talk about stratigraphy, that is the strata or layers of rock, of sedimentary rock that's laid down on uh, the surface of the earth. And these strata build up over time. This is the law of superposition that was first worked out by Nicholas Steno back in the early 1600s. Stratigraphy gives us the way in which we characterize the rocks based on their lithological characteristics. And so you may have learned of the terms groups, formations, and members. So a formation in a geological technical term is a unit or body of rock which is, has similar lithology and which can be mapped on a geological map. Groups are collections of formations while formations can have be split into individual different types of members. They may have unique lithologies or characteristics that define them. But the fundamental principle of this is the lithology, the rock type is different and can be mapped on the surface. There's another term called facies uh, this is not regarding your face or people's faces. Facies is in reference to lateral changes within the unit which reflect changes in the depositional environment. So facies could be a depositional environment like a beach type depositional environment versus a desert sort of environment. They both may have very similar lithologies, both made out of sandstone but the interpretation of the depositional environment and the characteristics of that will be very different. In fact, the fossils that you find in a beach will be very different than the fossils you might find in the desert, even though the rocks, the lithology of the rocks may be very similar. Lithophases are the changes in the physical characteristic of the rocks, whereas biophases are the characteristic changes that you see in the rocks based on the fossils that you find in those rocks. The last term we're going to define is zones. Zones are kind of interesting in that they define a sort of three-dimensional or two-dimensional zone uh, in the rocks of where you find characteristic fossils or a particular fossil species in many cases. Now there's two types of zones. There's biozones and there's chronozones. And they're very different. I'll explain exactly what each one of these are. So a biozone is the three dimensional, so this is sort of latitudinal, longitudinal, and temporal. So think of it as like a three dimensional sort of zone or body of rock in which a particular species may occupy, or a group of species, and we'll talk about that in a second. So biozone is where we have a geographic but also stratigraphic distribution of various organisms or a particular organism. So oftentimes a zone, a biozone, will be defined by a species. So in this case we have Exodus albus a biozone. Chronozone is the only the temporal range of a species. 
So it's where we get the very first occurrence of the species in the stratigraphic record, and where we get the last appearance of that species in the stratigraphic record. Now, biozone and chronozone are fundamentally different in that biozone will probably track the different facies. So if this is a species that likes to live in the desert, it's going to be found in the desert depositional environments, and it may not be found in the beach deposits. Chronozone will basically just define that time period. This is a fundamental difference, and I'll give you an illustration of it. So here we have the geographic distribution of a marine invertebrate today, and you can see that it's pretty widespread. Now we can define the biozone here in a geographic range of where you find this particular species in the northern Atlantic Ocean today. And it's pretty widespread. It's a pretty widespread um, species, and so it's going to be found in the fossil record in this very wide geographic area. So that's the biozone. Now imagine that you sample the fossil record outside of this geographic range, say up in the Arctic, near off the coast of Greenland. Well, there it's too cold for this species, this particular species, and you don't find it. So it'll be outside the biozone, but it'll be within the chronozone because it's within the same time period. So this is kind of an interesting fundamental difference between chronozones and biozones. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in attempting to date rocks using fossils. Now another very important principle that you often get in intro geology courses is the idea of correlation. That is where you have two geographically dispersed sedimentary bodies of rock. They're stacked in stratigraphic layers. And inside these rocks are unique fossils. The fossils, you'll find the oldest ones at the bottom and the youngest ones at top. And as events have occurred on their surface, there's major extinction events and evolution, and so new species appear in the rock record. You can take this correlation and go to another body of rocks far away and do the additional thing. You can sample the fossils in that stratigraphic column label where they occur. And what you often see, in fact, most of the time, 99% of the time, you'll see the same sort of sequence of fossils in the fossil record. You can then basically use correlation between the two because they may not be fossil, or they may be covered by other materials or something, or ocean between the two. And so you can correlate these between these two. And in fact, very early on, when William Smith came up with his map, Early geologists went to Europe and saw very similar rocks on the other side of the English chana Channel and were able to map out many of the layers that they saw in England and correlate these based on the sequence of fossils that they found in the fossil record. And this was done in the early 1820s and became instrumental in the Industrial Revolution as it gave us ability to predict where we might find valuable natural resources like coal that were used in the establishment of early steam locomotion during that period of time. So correlation is a very important principle in geology and has very important predictive powers that we can use. So you probably know that by stacking these rocks up and studying the fossils, we can define geological time periods. And so you've probably heard of the Mesozoic and the Paleozoic and the Cenozoic and all these different ages and stages that are defined on the fossil record. So dinosaurs lived in the Mesozoic period. They lived in, from the Triassic and throughout the Jurassic and even in the Cretaceous. And so everybody's seen Jurassic Park and knows that there's lots of Jurassic fossils or dinosaurs <laughs> in the movie. But there's also a lot of Cretaceous dinosaurs in the movie too. But Cretaceous Park just didn't sound very good. But anyway, we can define these periods of time by the types of animals that lived in each one of these periods of time. And this is the principle of biostratigraphy. By discovering and identifying fossils in the stratigraphic column, we can use that information to pinpoint the geographic and geological age that each of these fossils find into. And then we can use that, basically, that precision to get at the date or the period of time or the age of that rock unit that we're interested in. So here is an example of um, different ranges of species of fossils that have been found in the rock record. And so the important thing is to measure in where these fossils occur in the rock layers 
and put together a biostratigraphic range of all the fossils that you've identified in the rock record. And you get a biostratigraphic range chart like this, where you know you have some species that you find in every single rock unit, and other ones where you just find it in various areas. Now you can define the first appearance and last appearance and draw a line between them. Or sometimes you might have um, just one or two individuals spread out over a period of time. So you want to draw those, those first and last appearances, and you can get a complete range of the different types of species. We can then use these ranges to basically refine the geological time scale to even beyond just periods like the Jurassic Age and focus in on more and more refined zones based on these fossils. Many of them are microfossils or marine invertebrates. They're very important for establishing ages of rocks. Now, one of the things that's happening is that with biostratigraphy is you're looking at big events in the fossil record. So big events are going to be major extinction events. These major extinction events are going to be oftentimes where we define these boundaries between one age and another age. And so you oftentimes will have a period of time of diversification and then some sort of annihilation or extinction event that wipes out a group and then a new group comes in. And that's what allows us to identify these different zones, these chronozones throughout time based on these various events that happen that wipe out many species both living in the ocean and living on land. One of the tricks of creating good biozones is that you want good index fossils to define those zones. Index fossils are going to be the fossils that you basically name that period or that zone after. Now, when you're picking an index fossil, or when scientists are trying to decide what makes a good index fossil, there's a number of characteristics that we need to define. First, this fossil has got to have a really wide geographic distribution. So oftentimes, index fossils are marine fossils because mar the marine record's a little bit better than the terrestrial record. So you want one that has a very widespread occurrence. You also want one that has a very high ecological tolerance. They can live in many different types of depositional environments that it would be preserved in. So if you found a fossil that lived both in the desert and on a beach, that would be ideal because you could date basically both of them because they would be found in both, both environments. The other thing is abundance. You want something that you don't have to really search for. So you want an index fossil that has lots and lots of fossils that you can use, and they're rarely discovered in the rock record. The other thing is something that has a, a rapid evolutionary rate. This means uh, there's a turnover in index fossils. If you have an index fossil that you know, lived for, for 100 million years, for example, <laughs> it's not going to be very good versus one that's lived only 100,000 years in the rock record. So you want a good uh, index fossil that has very short durations. Um, so you know things that, that, that come and go very quickly and, and also are changing quite a bit. The other thing you want with your index fossil is a very distinct morphological feature. Uh, it's very easy to identify your index fossils. So I work a lot on fossil mammal teeth. And the reason that you look at mammal teeth is because they uh, they make great index fossils. Rudent teeth are found in the fossil record throughout. They have a wide dis distribution. Many of these um, little mammals are found in many continents at the same time. They are abundant in terrestrial deposits. They change very rapidly. And they have these teeth that you can easily identify them to species if you just have a, a bit or fragment even of a tooth. You can oftentimes identify it to species. So that's a very good index fossil. A horrible index fossil would be something like uh, an alligator is a good example, or something that really hasn't changed throughout geological time that much, and that you need a really nice complete skeleton to be able to identify a species. Um, and so that's a good example. Um, but you know, there's lots of examples we'll talk about throughout this uh, semester of other fossils that may not be very good for index fossils because they really haven't changed that much. All right, so one of the things that you have to be careful of when you're doing this and choosing your index fossil is that in the rock record, things are happening. Depositional environments are changing, and we're having oftentimes regression and transgression cycles where the shoreline comes over and covers up the continent, 
and then it falls away. So the transgression regression of oceans are going to leave behind a unique signature in the fossils, particularly if we're looking at fossils that live within, uh, within a shoreline environment. So when we have a shoreline come in, you'll see the first occurrence of those species. And when the shoreline retreats, they'll disappear, even though they haven't gone extinct. This has become kind of problematic when we do a geological, define the geological ages, because oftentimes in regressions where sea level drops, you get a lot of last appearances of fossils because it's the marine record that you're basing it off. So sea level drop or sea level fall often means you have less of those species. And so they, they, there's kind of a, um, a sort of mis, not a mass extinction, but sort of a mass non-preservation event there. Whereas where you have sea level rise, you suddenly get lots of new occurrences. So this is something to be very careful with. And a lot of paleontologists are always kind of worried whether they're capturing these transgression regression sequences in their strat columns and their biostratigraphic ranges, or if there is something else that's defining this. So understanding the facies and how that can influence the fossils you find is very important. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can date rocks using fossils. And this is using a technique called the correlation methods technique, or Shaw's method. And it's a very cool way of basically um, comparing one location, uh, one stratigraphic um, column, to another stratigraphic column. And this is very important if there is a well-defined or well-studied stratigraphic sort of type section. I'll talk about that in a second. And you want to compare it with your own section. Say, you know, there's a, the Jurassic, for example, is defined on the Jura Mountains in Switzerland. And you want to compare the Jurassic record that we have here in Utah with that record over there. So one of the things you can do is, is use this technique to see what age those rocks are that we have here in Utah with those rocks over there in Europe and compare the two. So we're going to use something called the correlation method. It's oftentimes called the graphic analysis technique as well, or Shaw's method. And Shaw was the first person to kind of come up with this idea. So there's two terms I want to define. That is FAD, -D, and FAD means the first appearance datum, and LAD, and that's the last appearance datum. So this is going to be the first appearance and the last appearance. Now FAD and LAD could be uh, globally as a chrono zone, chrono zone, or it could be a biozone within the single section that you're dealing with. So you'll oftentimes see those abbreviations when we talk about biostratigraphic ranges. So here we have two sections, maybe one's in Europe and one's here in Utah, and we want to compare them. And we have our ranges of different species, and here we have nine species. Now most of the time when you compare these, uh, if you have pretty good overlap, you're going to get a straight line uh, when you compare it. So in this case, we're graphing the two sections. So we have section Y and we have section X. Let's make our X and Y uh, uh, um, axes on the graph. And then we put in the distance in each one of those where we get the first appearance of each of those shared species in both of those sections. And when you do this, you get, um, so we have the base of the range and the top of the range. This would be the same thing as the first appearance datum and the last appearance datum. And you'll see that as you go through, there's a straight line. And so what's really cool about this is that you can take a rock, say in section X, you just go six feet up and you go across and you can see where it is in the section Y. Now what makes this really cool for dating using fossils is imagine that you have a radiometric date that's at uh, eight feet above the base here in Europe. Someone has, has, there's a volcanic ash right here. That means that you can follow this along and then go down, which is close to eight here, it's pretty much one on one, and you can actually date that strata as being, you know, if it's 10 million years old, you can date it that way. So you can correlate stratigraphic dates. You can correlate um, paleomagnetic reversals. You can correlate geochemical signatures in the rock. And this is a really powerful tool. It's also very powerful if you're using cores and you want to correlate between wells and you only have the subsurface data in cores and you've been running your, your um, biostratigraphy on 
microfossils, you can use this technique. And this allows you to correlate the beds, not based on lithology, but based on time, based on the appearance of these fossils. So it's a pretty powerful tool. Now, one of the things you have to be aware of, too, when you do this is it's not always that simple. Because oftentimes when you move around geographically in the world and you're comparing Utah and Europe, you're dealing with very different um, sedimentary rates. So in this case, we're going to do is we have section X is only going to be, you know, 100 feet thick, whereas section Y is 200 feet thick. So the sedimentary rate was twice as fast in section Y as it was in section X. So if we do this, you'll note like right below, here we have section X, which has um, a lot more sediment, whereas section Y has less sediment. It only has 5 feet, whereas section Y has 10 feet. And here's our ranges. Now notice that when we have a condensed section, the ranges start to shrink and get smaller because they're closer together. There's less time, or there's less deposition happening but more the same amount of time that's represented in that stratigraphic section. So when we compare these, we can do the same thing. They'll follow along a straight line, the first and last appearances, and then we can follow these across to figure out the position within the stratigraphic body for each one of these. This is a great way to figure out sedimentary rates sort of gross sedimentary rates for different basins, for example. So comparing one basin to another basin, you can figure out the differences in sedimentary rates between these various basins, or even within a basin. Um, it's a great technique. And so you oftentimes will then get a skewed uh, correlation between these two. Now, sometimes you'll get something like this when you graph it. And this occurs when the sedimentary uh, rates change. So the amount of sediment that's building up changes. So in this case, what happened was you had a very slow sedimentary rate here in uh, Y. So it's pretty slow. In fact, when we get up here, we're only about uh, 2 and a half versus 5. So the sedimentary rate is half of what it is in X and Y here. But then at this point, for whatever reason, there might be a change in the depositional environment. It just might be a change in climate. It may be a change in the tectonics, the regional tectonics. But at that point, then sedimentation really took off in Y, and you get a straight um, line kind of going in a different direction. And that means that the sedimentary rates changed. Another thing to be aware of is a broken line. Now, a broken line would indicate an unconformity. So that would be where you would have, in one of your sections, you'd all of a sudden get a whole group of species appearing and a whole group disappearing. If you have another section that you're comparing that to and they're all ranges are going through that period, then it would indicate they have unconformity. And this is a great way to identify para-unconformities. These are unconformities that are on um, it within the stratigraphic record, which are along the bedding plane. So they're really difficult to see, and maybe there's not a change in lithology. So those are a great way to use biostratigraphy to figure out where you might have these unconformities. And this is really important in sequence stratigraphy, where you're looking for unconformities um, that might exist and looking for um, some sort of boundary surface there where you might get these things. So, so, so graphic correlation method is a great way to do this using biostratigraphy and fossils. All right, so here, here's another thing that we can talk about. So in this case, we're talking about sort of local sections that you've measured. But we can use the correlation method to build up a composite biostratigraphic chart. And so in this case, we have sort of two species of trilobites. This is Merivillia and Kuzilla, and they're both uh, found in different types of depositional environments. And so what we can do is where each one of these occur, we can look to see what other uh, species co-occur in the rocks with these two species. And there is some co-occurrence between these, but there's other species that are only found in the other one, indicating that there might be some um, biological um, limiting factor in the habitat that these little trilobites lived in. And so they some want to be in one location, others want to be in a different location. 
All right, so let's take a look at how we can build up a composite strat by a stratigraphic chart. So we can use the correlation method to build these up. So you take one section and another section, and you put in the first appearance and the last appearance of each of the species into your column. And then what you do is, based on their last and first appearance, you expand out the range and make a composite section. So here we have species A. And notice that in the stripe section here, it lasts a little bit longer. And in the plain section over here, it, it appears a little bit earlier. So now we can put together a chrono zone that would basically encompass all of these. And you know, here's B. <laughs> now B is you know, fairly long over in this section, but only, only maybe one occurrence here. So that's not going to change very much because we had the most occurrence there. Here's C. Here's C here, so we compare the two. So this bottom stripe section, we get a little bit longer. And in the plain one, we get a little bit, um, it hangs around for a little bit longer. So then we can put together a composite section of these two sections to maybe expand out the ages for each one of those occurrences. Then we can keep doing this, right? So we can find another one, another stippled section that we throw in there. And here we have the same three species we can build up. And this way, we can build up that chronozone. So it's um, as kind of that very first occurrence and the very last occurrence. So pretty cool technique. And this is what uh, biostratigraphy use all the time. And this is what geologists use to define geological ages. Now, why does it work? And this is a question um, we're going to discuss in the paper that I've assigned. Um, this is a paper that we go into a little bit more detail in using uh, correlation methods in my advanced stratigraphy class. But in this case, we're going to be talking about um, why it basically works as biostratigraphy, where we could try to maybe break it, see if we can break it. So the reason that it works is that for the most part, that these species have a geographic range. And so as long as there's an overlap, enough of an overlap in their geographic range in the sections you're looking at, and you share species, you're going to be able to do this. Now, where it could break is imagine that each, so, so here's sort of scenarios down here, biozones. And here's kind of like an easy one, right? But down here, this one, they have the biozones kind of going crazy, right? You have M species like moving from one place over a long geological time. It moves to another place, but goes extinct over in the other place. Another one moves from that place and moves across and goes to another place. So you know these transitions between the two. But even if you have you know, one spinning back and forth, you probably get a pretty straight line. So these are basically the charts from those previous runs. So you can play around with this in computer models, where you can build these crazy weird biozones of weird proportions, weird blobs. And then you can run your sections through there to see uh, how you can share these. And what they find is that fundamentally, even with pretty weird distributions of species, it's still pretty, it works. You really have to have really weird distributions. But the other key to this is that you need shared fossils between the geographic areas that you're comparing in correlation methods. If you're dealing with a terrestrial realm and you're dealing with a marine realm, it can be very difficult to compare the two just using fossils. In that case, you know, using paleomagnetic reversals, using radiometric dates, using chemostratigraphic techniques will be superior to using fossils. But if you're comparing marine to marine of the equivalent ages and you have shared species, for shared fossil species, it's very easy to compare the two and figure out the age of your rock that you're looking at. All right, so when geologists were first defining these geological periods, they decided to set up type sections. So it was like the Jura Mountains was going to be the Jurassic type section. And this has gotten to be very problematic in modern geology. And there's debate whether to just strip away and not use type sections. So there's a problem with this. Okay, So in, um, in stratigraphy, if we have type section. So in case, this case, we have type section A, which is geological period A. That could be Jurassic or Cretaceous or Triassic or whatever. We're just going to call it geological period A. And we define geological age B. 
and geological age C. And we have three type sections. Maybe these are in Spain and Australia and Africa. And those are the areas that everybody compares to. And they have a fossils that they, they have in there. Now, one of the problems you have is when you're comparing lots of other places and you find a rock, so example is here, here this rock um, layer here, where there's an overlap between age A type section and age B type section. So I should say stage because these are, these are not necessarily ages, these are rock units that we're comparing. So in this case, there's overlap. And the problem is, is well, do you call this part of B or do you call this part of A? There's overlap. You're like, ah, I don't know. Um, so because you're talking about rocks, we're going to use the term upper. So this would be the upper A. <laughs> or is it in the lower B? If you're talking about time, it, not talking about rocks, just time, you'd use late and early. Whereas you're talking about the rock units that define that, that period of time, then you use upper or lower because you're in reference to the type stratigraphic section. So upper and lower Jurassic is you're basically saying something about the rocks in, in reference to the time those rocks represent and the physical rocks so this is kind of problematic, right? So we have, oh, it could be in either one. Here's another example where we can have a gap between the two type sections. And we find some rocks between those two. Well, do we call them Jurassic or we call them B or C? We don't know. The Jurassic, the Cretaceous, we don't know. They're kind of in that gap between there. So we have to redefine the, that zone. So in the old day, they would basically go out. They would find a series of rocks. They would define those as the type section for the Jurassic, and everybody would compare to that type section and build up this composite, you know, list strat biostratigraphic list. Um, but this became problematic for these two reasons, and so what geologists have been turning to is an alternative method. So the alternative method that geologists have been using is what's called a GSSP. These are the Global Boundary Stratotype Sections and Points. So instead of defining a body of rock layers as representing a type section for a particular age or period of time, like the Jurassics, um, what instead they do is they define a key point in the stratigraphic column. So what they do is they go and they find a stratigraphic unit, a rock unit, and they find where there's characteristics. Oftentimes, they'll be the last appearance or the first appearance of an index fossil that we talked about. Or it might be some sort of um, global event that's tied in, sort of maybe a chemostratigraphic point, um, maybe a mass extinction point, like the iridium layer that defines a KT boundary. So something like that. They go to a place that has it well preserved in the rock face. And they say, this is going to be the point. And they call it a golden spike. And oftentimes when they name these, there's a big ceremony. There's a very formal way in which these are described. They come out in a paper where they say, this is going to be the point. And you can look these up, these points up in stratigraphy.org. And you can go there. This is put together by the International Commission of Stratigraphy. And they basically define these points. And so you know, here's the Maastrichtian age, which is defined. So they usually will give an age, the best estimate of the age, with a plus or minus next to it. Um, they will give the location. So the Maastrichtian age, the boundary there, is given a location. There's the lat long, so you can go there. Here's a little bit about the boundary level. And this is why they d defined it, basically, on these ammonite biozones, the, the first appearance datum of the ammonite, Bacchiodiscus. Nebriensis, and the boreal proxy is the first appearance datum of the Blemonite, Blemonelli lasitilata. And this is the status that's been ratified in 2001, and this is the reference that you can look at defining that. Usually there's like a big ceremony when they do these, and there's quite a few now that have been defined. So this is the international chronostratigraphic chart showing all of these ages and where there's a little golden spike that you see along 
there between these ages are uh, ones that have been defined. If you don't see a little spike, they haven't yet decided on where they want to put this, um, this spike and define that zone. So let's zoom in on to the Ordovician here. The Ordovician is right here. It's divided into the upper, middle, lower. And then each one of these is the stage or age. And these are oftentimes defined, these are global stage and ages defined on the fossil record. And most of the age, stages and ages are defined on marine fossils. Okay? So then each between these, we have golden spikes and we have radiometric, the latest radiometric ages. And this is updated like every year. So you can kind of go in, or every few years, you can go in and see what the most recent dates are because um, they shift around a little bit. Um, and uh, so here we have the dates. Now, this is a chart. This is the Ordovician chronostratigraphic chart. Now, one of the things that they've done here is we have the global, so that's what that first graph that I showed you um, shows. So the global is defining the, the different stages here. But here's the issue. Um, depending on where you go on the planet, there's different fossils, right? Different biozones, different coming together and stuff. So in each sort of um, region, each region has a local stage. So here's the North American stages. So the more North American stages are defined by the fossils found in North America. And then these are compared with other fossils, building that composite biostratigraphic section to put together the global stages and ages that we use to define them. And so this is done because, you know, in North America we'll find a lot of species there you only find in North America. In Australia you'll find species that are only found in Australia. And so there'll be enough of shared fossils between the two continents that you can tie them together. There'll also be, you know, things that you can find in the rock record to help you correlate between the various continents and build together a really com a composite stratigraphic section to define those ages. Big mass extinction events that affect all of the world will be oftentimes where you see the strongest supported boundaries between these different ages or different time periods. All right, here's another chart showing the Ordovician biochemical stratigraphic chart. So in this um, one here, we have the global stages for the Ordovician. And we slice these. These are, these are biozones. And here's the biozones. They're named after each of the species, the index um, species, found within only this zone. So when you find this species, then these are conodont species. Um, when you find them, that defines that period of time that you're looking at. So pretty cool. The other thing you can do is um, compare using um, isotopic curves. So this is um, delta C13 curves that you can use to give you a sequence. And so, um, so a lot of these fossils, we can look at the chemistry. And based on the isotopic composition, can tell you, you know, what's happening to the biosphere, but also what's happening to the climate. And these can help you correlate those events, as well as paleomagnetic reversals, um, radiometric dates that are put out there. But these biochemical um, charts can help you really pinpoint things. Like this last one up here is defined by the end of the heist, this really positive uh, carbon excursion that you see here um, near the end of the Ordovician. And then coming off that, there's not necessarily a particular index fossil to define that. So it's defined on these biochemical signals that you see in the rock. And this is observed globally, so in lots and lots of places where you see these curves that happen. So this allows you to date rocks really precisely because you don't necessarily have to have an age in any one of these points. Now there's the limits to this. There's definitely limits to it. But it's a very powerful tool. So I, being able to identify fossils in the rocks is going to be important because it's a very easy way then if you found one of these index fossils in your rock, you can precisely tell you what age that rock is. You can find the fossil and then you can compare it to other places. And if you find one of those index fossils, you know precisely what age you're dealing with. 
Thanks for watching. If you're watching this video from the internet and would like to participate and take a class at Utah State in geology, check out the website geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in who I am and my research, check out my website at benjamin slash burger.org. Thanks for watching.